Welcome back everybody to my YouTube channel. My name is Jimmy Kolb and I'm an equipped bench press specialist and I'm currently chasing the elusive 1400 pound bench. We did take it for a ride here to meet uh, this past weekend, but I'll get to that on another video. Anyhow, today I'm bringing back the bench press critiques. Haven't done those in a very, very long time. I've got a few videos for you here today uh, to critique and uh, without further ado, let's get started. All right, first video I have for you here is a raw bench sent to me. Uh, most of these came through Instagram, so if you do want your bench critiqued by me, constructive criticism, uh, please just DM me on Instagram. The easiest way to find me is Kolb Strong on IG. So this is a raw bench. I'm gonna go ahead and play the clip, and then we'll talk about it afterwards. There we go. We got it. We got a raw bench. Uh, looks to be probably around 335. I can't tell, tell if those are 10 or 5 pound plates. Look like 10s. Uh, we're in a uh, commercial gym setting. Nothing wrong with that. Uh, just not what I would do ever. Anyway, we're at a commercial gym. We're on uh, a hammer strength bench. I have personal experience on those and they are 100% garbage. But if it's what you have at your disposal, good on you for getting the work in anyhow. Uh, he's got a, uh, looks like an ab mat of sorts with those two little uh, eyelets at the top where you could like hang it on a wall for storage. So with the, the purpose of that was I, when I see people do that, what they're trying to do is make the pad a little bit wider because those commercial gym pads, like I had just previously mentioned, are just trash and they're very, very narrow. Uh, comp spec for most federations is 12 inches wide. Now, recently in the IPA, the 14-inch pad got approved. So that is comp spec as well if you compete in the IPA. So what he's trying to do is get a little bit more uh, width on the pad, which is great because a narrow pad can destroy your shoulders, which is where Donnie Thompson, Super D, good friend of mine, came up with the 14-inch pad in order to save people's shoulders. So uh, that is the first part that I see is on an ab mat. That's fine. Taking advantage of that. What we're seeing here is a bench that he's coming down very fast. Like, ooh, very, very, very fast. It's a touch and go bench. This is training, so that's fine. Um, you're, he's coming down with some speed, but I wouldn't call controlled speed. Uh, there's a fine line bet between coming down too slow and coming down really, really fast. And I, I would say, looking at this, it's definitely not a controlled speed. It was a very, very fast descent. And the problem with that is that you don't have a lot of tightness. You don't have a lot of control over the bar. So that's the first thing I would say. He definitely needs to slow down a little bit, not put the brakes on and do like a bodybuilder tempo bench. When you're trying to bench the most weight possible, especially raw, you do not want to come down super slow like a bodybuilder, but you also don't want to... Uh, drop it like this because on top of that if it was enough weight you risk uh, hurting yourself as well after he gets the the touch we'll watch it again he chucks it up really quick but then the bar stalls about halfway so you see that a lot um, it's a transition thing so when you're benching you come down in one motion and you, you see the bar come up in two motions. So what that's caused by is the, the lifter is using a lot of chest and a lot of shoulder and they're pressing. I know it's called a bench press, but I, I've talked about before and my patrons on Patreon know a lot about this too. It's all about extending with the triceps. You have to learn how to use the triceps in the bench, but you're getting a big heave ho, you know, a touch and go and you're pushing. And then once you're big pushing, pressing muscles, the chest and the pecs, wears off, the, the triceps have to take over and, and extend to lock the weight out. So that's why you have that two-step uh, concentric. So eccentric lowering, concentric on the way up. You have that two-step uh, press because the triceps are not engaged and they are not ready to catch that weight. And as we can see there, uh, looking at the, the commencement of the press again, the, the lockout is the hardest part. So that tells me that his triceps are more than likely underpowered uh, strength-wise in comparison to his larger chest and uh, shoulder muscles. Very natural for those muscles. If you look in comparison in size, obviously uh, those things are, th those muscles are much 
much larger than the triceps. It is very unnatural to have triceps that overpower the shoulders and pecs because we use our arms or our shoulders and our pecs in everyday life very, very often. So it is natural, especially on a max effort bench, that you want to use the muscles that are strongest to do the bench. But in reality, if you bench with your chest too much, too heavy, that's what can lead to the pec tears. I've been saying it for years, and this is why I don't do the raw thing because I don't want the injury. I don't want the risk of that injury. So just to recap, definitely need some control coming down. Touch and go, I don't care. It's a training lift. It doesn't matter if you touch and go, that's fine. But you need some control coming down. He needs to learn how to engage the triceps from the beginning of the lift. You often hear that cue where uh, the lifters are talking about, you know, press the bar up, and then when you get about halfway up when the bar starts slowing down, start to try, try to rip the bar in half, try to pull the bar apart to activate the triceps. I'm like, I argue, why wait? Why wait till the end? Why not do that at the beginning? It's a very tricky thing to learn how to do. Boards are an excellent tool to, uh, to learn this. It took me a long time to figure it out. Uh, but if you can activate the triceps at the beginning of the lift, you then have a tricep dominant press and you, you won't find that that hiccup in the middle, you'll have one smooth transition from the bottom to the top. So, I mean, otherwise, successful lift. Uh, got it all the way up. I mean, there was that stall, but he was fully locked out. We didn't see the very beginning of the lift. Um, it, it looks like it started just as his elbows kind of cracked and the video started and it came down, but he locked it all the way out, full extension, and then re-racked it. So, I mean, successful lift, good lift. Um, I, and I was going to say something about his lower body. I, I, if you guys know me enough, I've seen these critique videos. I'm not a big fan of the feet being tucked underneath the pad way back uh, up on the toes because you just don't have enough lower body power. On these commercial benches, not only are they very, very narrow, they're also very low to the ground. And the lower the, the, the pad is to the floor, uh, the less lower body engagement you have. So that's standard bench comp again for me, IPA, RPS, uh, even APF arguably, uh, you're going to have pads from the top of the pad to the floor. It's going to be between 17 and a half to 18 and a half inches. That's standard. Anything lower than that, like the combo racks and stuff like that, or even commercial type benches are probably 16 and below. And you just have no lower. That's why I'm, I'd argue every person on the planet can probably bench more than they can floor press. Like, yes, the floor press, you're pausing, which adds a level of difficulty. You're breaking up the eccentric concentric chain, but you also have zero lower body. There is no lower body at all in that lift. So that's why the floor press is so much harder than the regular bench because you do have some lower body engagement. But when the bench is so damn low, it's not totally eliminated, but it is extremely hindered. But that's just commercial gym life for you. Good job on the bench anyway. I hope these tips help you bench more weight. Never enough, right? So, uh, all right, that's going to do it for that video. And then we're going to move on to video number two. Okay, this next video came to me from a gentleman down in uh, South America. And he said he was a big fan of mine, which appreciate the support. Anyway, so we're looking at another raw bench. Um, and he's in a, he's in a gym. It doesn't look like it's a commercial gym. Although, I mean, something outside the country, I, you know, who knows, but anyhow, uh, the first thing I can see as he's getting the hand off here, his spotter's letting go of the bar as the weight is becoming his, he's shuffling his legs around a little bit on the floor. Not a lot, but there is some, uh, all of those little, those little ticks, all those little uh, movements need to be eliminated. They need to be taken care of and done it over with before the weight even leaves the rack. It's just adding a level of instability that you just don't need in the bench. So you do want to make sure you are firmly planted uh, before the weight even leaves. I mean, the bench is not supposed to be a comfortable lift. If you're doing it correctly and you're trying to use the full body, you don't want to just limit yourself to just using the pecs and shoulders or whatever, just your arms. You want to use the full body. Um, so it's like a it's like a squat laying down. So you definitely want to make sure you're, you're as tight as you possibly can. Your legs, your back, everything should be almost cramping when you're done with the set. I've been doing it this one way 
uh, just as I had described for the last 14 years competitively. So I don't even think about her anymore. It's just like a part of it, you know, that soreness and that overall body tightness and fatigue. So after he gets the handoff and the spotter staying very close, again, for training, that's fine. Uh, when I'm talking about like competitive bench, the spotter definitely needs to at least pivot out of the way for the hedge judge to be able to judge the lift correctly. But for training purposes, and we do this as well for me and my guys, for training to be as safe as possible, you stay over the bar. Competitive purposes, you, you need to get off the bar and make sure the lift can be judged properly. So the first thing I can notice, he's not completely flared like a bodybuilder would be. This is called internal rotation. He's not completely flared, but his tuck is very minimal, very, very minimal tuck. You can see that immediately as he's coming down. His elbows are more or less kind of flared. I would like to see it like at least a 45 degree angle with the elbows. Uh, when I do my, my reverse grip bench, I'm actually locked into a tuck position the whole time. Uh, which is optimal for your shoulder. We want to take that shoulder uh, joint, that capsule, you got your humerus bone. We want to open that joint as much as we possibly can. We don't want to jam it up into here and grind all that soft tissue. That's, that's bad. That's bad for your shoulders. If you're tucked, you take that joint and you open it up and you free it. That's what we want with that ball and socket joint for the shoulder. Very shallow ball and socket joint, uh, which is why it can get hurt so damn easily. So a little bit more tucking would be good. Um, his leg position could use a little bit of work. He's he just kind of like he just kind of sat down and laid back, and wherever his legs ended up, they ended up. Um, I think he should be to get optimal lower body engagement in the bench. I think he should be maybe a little bit more wide and just kind of work them back a little bit more towards the front end of the bench, just a little bit, just to keep some more tension on the legs. Uh, but it, a lot of people bench this way successfully, so I'm not going to say too much about his leg position. It's just not what I would do. If I was coaching it, um, I would want the legs to be a little bit more uh, driven back. So after he gets the touch, a little pause, a little competitive pause, um, the elbows almost immediately, so the minimal tuck that he does have, so let's just say that if this is completely flared, he's tucked like this, as soon as the press begins, the first thing the elbows do, they pop out. So you want to try to maintain a tuck position for as long as possible. So if you're in an optimal tuck, what I don't want to see, and a lot of people do this, especially when they are going for maximum weights and they kind of panic, they're tucked, they're perfect. As soon as they press, they go, ah, they flare out, they struggle all the way up like this. My, my shit just popped, actually, so hope you heard that. Um, this is a very powerful position. You want to maintain that for a lot of the lift and then towards the halfway, maybe slightly above the halfway mark, then you flare and lock the weight out. We can lock out more weight in a flared position than we can tucked, but we can press more from a tucked position than we can flared. So it's almost like this corkscrew motion where you're tucked and then flare, tuck, flare. But the flaring needs to happen more towards the very end of the lift, again, to maintain that powerful press and at the very top, flare out, lock out like that. So he is that minimal tuck that he has. He's flaring very quickly. I'd like to see him tuck more and then maintain that tuck for longer uh, to, to bench more weight. I can see his legs kind of shaking, it, getting involved. So he is pushing with the legs. Uh, I think that the, the pressing power of the lower body is just slightly hindered just by the position of the legs, like I mentioned before. Everybody's different. So everybody's leg position is going to be slightly different. I mean, I've got a variety of different body types in my own crew, including myself. Um, so we all have slightly different setups. Um, so he might be, he could be taller than I'm thinking. I mean, I, you know, I have no clue uh, how tall he is or what he weighs. It's hard to even see the weight. It could be, I'm not sure if the inner plates are hundreds or if they're 45s. This could be 295. This could be three and the high threes it's hard to tell from the video uh but again uh talking about like body positioning and stuff like that there are things i see like like positioning and the elbows overall again you know you got a slight press there successful lift all the way up and there it was more smooth there was no real like stop and then continue it was a little slow but it was continuous all the way up 
Um, and then adversely, compared to the first video, he came down, if we look at it again, handoff, he's coming down very slow. So there's that balance. If you compare the first video with the second video, you have a uncontrolled, very fast drop descent. Ooh. But then you also have this uh, this lifter who's coming down what I would what I would call like bodybuilder tempo slow. And what that's doing is just it's it's more time under tension. Again, equipped is a little bit different, but when you're raw, you gotta have that balance. He's burning a lot of oxygen, a lot of fuel coming down, bringing that weight down super slow. Um, definitely has control of it. Uh, I just think he should speed that up a little bit to have more fuel for the, the concentric or the press uh, to come back up. But other than that, good job. I hope those tips helped. I hope we enjoyed that video. We got one more coming to you. So we'll go ahead and start that one and we'll wrap this thing up. All right, we made it. So we're to the uh, final video for today. Uh, this was sent to me again by a, a competitive lifter through Instagram. Again, that's Kolb Strong. If you want your video critique, send it through uh, DM me on Instagram. Uh, so based on the equipment and based on the barbell, you can kind of see on the smooth part of the bar on the maybe the lifter's right side, the lifter's right side or the screen on the left side of the screen, that little red sticker or emblem, which is like an Illico. So I'm assuming this is probably an IPF sanctioned competition or USAPL, not a huge fan. So yeah, so this is what this is where he wants to compete. This is what he's doing. Uh, self handoff, not not a huge fan of self handoffs. I think you you are ultimately limiting yourself to how much weight you can lift. Whether that's a personal thing, if you feel as though if you can't lift the weight out of the rack, you shouldn't be benching it, which I've been told before. Or if if you just it's you consider it to be like part of the lift, you, it's just, it's a strength thing you wanna you wanna do. That's fine. But if you're trying to bench the most weight you possibly can, take a handoff. And the USAPL kind of annoys me because they have a, a designated meat handoff person. Um, you can't have your own, you can't have somebody from your crew, you can't have your wife or your best friend or a training partner. They have a designated guy that hands off the weights to every lifter in the meet. So say what you will about that. But he's doing a self handoff. Uh, the the angle is, it, it's it's looking kind of like right down Main Street, so it's it's hard to see, you know. Like I, I prefer a forty five degree angle to the lifter, so I can definitely see like elbow position, uh, look at other things. But I can tell I can tell a lot from this video just from this angle. Uh, he's got uh, for the combo rack, the combo rack that he's using. And I don't care what brand. I'm not a brand whore. I don't care if it's a Lico, Ghost, Texas Strength, ER. A combo rack is a combo rack, and in my opinion, they're all fucking garbage. They just suck. They're just not good pieces of equipment to lift on. Sorry. Um, so he's trying to get the most optimal leg and foot position for the equipment that he is competing on. And again, other reasons I don't like, personally, the uh, ER style or the combo rack style of lifting equipment is because the pads are very thin and hard they're very narrow 16 inches or less sometimes and they're very close to the ground but if you are you know if you are committed to a federation that uses them if you're a usapl all the way or uspa or some of these other feds that use them all full time then that you have to make the best of it and that's what he's trying to do here and a lot of times what they do on the self handoff is they have their ass off the bench using their lower body to get a more declined position to be able to get that bar out of the rack. They take it out and then they have to then, so they're holding it and then they have to lower their ass to the bench, still holding it until these two side judges give their dumb little start uh, hand gesture. And then the head judge will see, okay, hand down, hand down, start. Is how is how they do it like these feds so you know again i think you're just burning extra fuel when you're having to hold it you know self hand off which takes out energy pulling it out yourself lowering your ass 
holding it, waiting for these two judges to make up their mind so that the head judge can then say, start. So you're, it's just a lot of time under that weight. Especially, again, this is a raw bench that we're watching. We got three raw benches today. So he gets the start call from the head judge, brings it down. And again, it's hard to see from this type of angle uh, things that are really, really important like elbow position. From here... Um, and I'll explain why I think this, but it looks like he's very flared. Like he's touching high on the chest. It looks like he's flared. And I say that because as he's pressing, I see no change from this angle in his elbow. Like as he pushes, it's just the elbows stay in the exact same position. There is no tucked and then kind of flaring out. It just looks like he's flared. He touches, gets the press call, and just pushes, and that's it. There, there is no changing of elbow position. So he looks very flared. That's one thing I would definitely say you need to tuck more. And now, from what I understand, in the U even in the USAPL, you are allowed to touch lower than that sternum. They, used, they had a rule for years where the xiphoid process, which is that bony protrusion at the bottom of your sternum, was the lowest point you could touch, which meant you had to basically chest press. You couldn't come down low on the belly. Uh, they changed that rule. So you can come down on the upper abs, mid abs, if you're, you can bench that low. So you can tuck, because if you had to touch on the chest, if you have to touch on the chest, you have to be flared. If I try to touch on the chest and I try to tuck, see what my forearm is doing? It's leaning backwards now. That's out of position. You want everything to remain. This is kind of a new age term and I hate using it, but it makes a lot of sense. You want everything, you want your elbow, your forearm, and your hand to be stacked. This is where you want to be. So if you have to bench on the chest, you have to maintain a flared out position. You're, you're limited. If you can come down low, I can now tuck while maintaining a stacked position. But if I try to tuck touching up here, that's what happens. Almost like a skull crusher. Your forearms are leaning backwards. So you don't want this is bad. If it, if it was enough weight, you can actually snap your forearms. I'm talking if it was an equipped bench you know, 300 pounds over your raw and you had never tried that weight before in your life and you may, and you got in a position where you were backwards, a lot of shearing forces, you can snap your forearm. I've seen it happen. But this is a raw bench and it looks like he's flared. It looks like he's touching kind of high on the chest. Again, I don't think that's great for maximum weight in the bench. He gets the press call. He, he launches, launches off the chest and about that midway point, that transition, the bar stalls. We can even see his right arm, his left arm wants to go and his right arm's like, nope, I'm going back down. And he just stalls there for a few seconds. The bar is not moving. Uh, that arm is not improving its position, staying down low and the spotters just take it from him. Good call because why risk the injury? Um, so that, that, that was a good call. So that, that, that halfway point, it's so much easier to blast through your sticking points, especially that midway, seems to be like not if you're off the chest, I would argue you have no upper back strength or tightness. If you're it's halfway, it's that transition. It's where a lot of people's chest and shoulders stop working, they're in their worst position, and then the triceps have to take over and continue the press. Or like I like I like to say the extension. So if your triceps, again, if your triceps are not engaged, I know it's called a bench press but we have to learn how to not engage from here. We have to learn to engage from back here with the triceps. If you can do that from the beginning, your triceps are engaged, they have the weight, and they're going to be prepared to carry that weight all the way to the top. If you just push and all this stops and your triceps are not ready to catch the weight, you're never gonna lock that weight out. I don't care how strong your triceps are, you have to engage them at the beginning of the lift. So I think that's what's happening here. He's just running out of gas halfway up. Those big chest muscles, uh, the shoulders are given out and the triceps, his one, his actually, yeah, I'd say uh, it looks like before the spotter grabs his right side, his left arm is actually like almost 100% locked out. At that point, you can, even if he would continue, if you lock this arm out and this arm is way down here and you continue and you get it without the spotter taking the bar, they would still probably call that. You can't have an extraordinary, you can't walk the weight up like this. 
There could be a slight deviation from side to side, but if you're like fully locked out and this arm is halfway down and you and you finish it, they're probably not going to give you that lift. You have to lock both elbows out relatively at the same time with a little bit of leeway, especially, and it depends on the judges as well, but that definitely, had he finished it, assuming this is an IPF affiliated meet based on what I'm seeing, they would not have counted it. They, they would not have given it to him, so that's unfortunate, but good effort anyway. I can't really tell the, let's see if I can look really close. He's got a couple of reds and a blue. This is probably in the 300s plus collars. He's probably in the mid to high 300s on this lift on in my opinion one of the shittiest pieces of equipment you could ever fucking bench on uh with a self handoff raw yeah so good effort good effort on that yeah definitely I just, I just think it needs it's all about position the bench is all about strength yes but it's also about positioning leverage mechanics proper engagement of the muscles again benching is built off of i don't care if you're raw or equipped it's back and triceps. I'm not saying everything, like these can't be strong. These have to be strong. But all of this cannot overpower this. This has to be the strongest part of your body in the bench press. Uh, followed closely by upper back and then your chest and, and, and shoulders. So, But yeah, good job on that. Uh, sorry for the missed lift, but uh, that's what I have to say about it. Hopefully that those tips can help you and your further endeavors in the bench. All right, that's going to wrap up this uh, this week's bench critique. I'm trying to bring this back and be a little more consistent for you guys. That's three videos per critique. I really hope uh, the lifters and all of you found some uh, value and the tips and tricks of the trade of heavy bench pressing from today's videos. Uh, before we wrap it up, I want to talk really quick that we do have a 501c3 nonprofit organization right here behind me. It's hard to see the Kolb Strong Powerlifting Scholarship. It's for young athletes. For every $1,000 we raise through donation and fundraisers, we cut checks to young athletes. It's designed for the young athletes ages 13 to 23, so that's the teenage and junior divisions of powerlifting. We remember being that age, and $1,000 would have really helped us. Uh, gym dues, new equipment, travel expenses, entering meet. So there you go. That, that's the Kolb Strong Scholarship. If you're interested in seeing full workouts, I do have. I still have my Patreon, uh, which is $10 a month right now, which is I use it as to say it's all the behind the scenes of all the big lifts that you see here on YouTube or possibly on Instagram. Uh, that's where I post my full training from set one to the last set of the day five days a week full workouts with commentary so check that out as well if you're in need of powerlifting equipment one of my longest time sponsors is anderson powerlifting your powerlifting superstore belts wraps sleeves ammonia chalk bench shirts squat suits anything you can think of anderson powerlifting has it if you want to go through anderson powerlifting for your powerlifting needs you can use this uh code right there called strong which is 10 percent off your order and that's going to do it for today. So like and subscribe. Uh, please let me know what you think about it below. We will try to get a lot more of these bench critiques out. We're trying to be more consistent on that. So thank you for your patience. And thank you for your views and your likes and your comments and your support. So for me and Katie, uh, have a good day. And we will see you next time.